Okay, so what is this long hop? Uh, first of all, very simple. Here's a picture from 1933. That is the long right? So the point is, we'll see more. But the point, the point thing is, the long hop is a boat, right? Worry later about why it's called that. What it is. But the boat sends spirits off to the spirit world after a purification ritual, period, right? Now, this is not unique to Malak, but some other things are. So, the particular forms, the kind of performance of the rituals, and ultimately the pageantry and spectacular display, those became uh, emblematic of Malaka, and they were indeed very special to Malaka. So, we're going to think about how that happened. Okay, now this is the boring part because we don't have pictures. But I have to do this. So the first question is, people always ask, is this Chinese or is it straight Chinese? And the answer to that question, in my opinion, <coughs> it's both Chinese and straight Chinese. But more than straight Chinese, it is Malacan. It is specifically Malacan. And I will explain why. So it began when the devotees of a god who was called Chu Hu Onya, this is Chu Onya, Devotees among the Babas and Donius who live in Kanda, rural Kanda, uh, got a temple built sponsored by the Tenghu Teng. Everybody here knows the Tenghu Teng was the master temple and the other temples were subordinate to it. So the Tenghu Teng committee sponsored the building of a temple in 1847. The believers in Kanda, they were Malacca born people, they were Malay speaking, but they have Chinese ancestors. You never get rid of your ancestors. And as you well know, your Chinese, the ancestors have a lot to do with your finding. But it's only on the male side. So we keep that in mind. The sponsors, the donors to the temple, were all Malacca-born people. They were successful businessmen who were prominent in Singapore. So these people had gone to Singapore, and they were still active back in Malacca. The connection is crucial. So, Malacca roots were important to them. The spiritual world in Malacca was important to them. It's very complicated. The place, and that was important. And finally, their ancestral graves and their ancestors were important to them. So, local devotees and these very prominent businessmen dealing in Singapore, all together, and ancestors were important. So, this is the starting place. Long Kong then developed from the performance of the rituals of Chu Ongya is became a citywide pageant later on. Alright. Now quickly, what was the spirit world in Malacca like at that time? Remember, speaking Malay, they, everybody's called the Dapo. Right? So the Chinese gods were Dapo. And that of course is a Malay word. Trees had Dapos, right? Rocks had Dapos, there were all these spirits. And there are all these dangerous wandering spirits around. Now, this is not that different from in South China. Because here, we talk about them in Malay, we have Malay traditions. But the point is, there were demonic spirits all over the place. And these are the spirits that interfere with them. So, for the Chinese, the ancestral spirits were the protectors. And uh, they connected us humans to the living spirit, to the spirit world, okay? So we're now talking about these bits and pieces. Uh, gods, ghosts, demons, and ancestors are all here. Now, the gods of the Dakos were often the lingering spirits of important men. In the Chinese tradition, most of the gods, the spirits who developed, were associated with living men, officials, generals, uh, maybe kings. And they then apotheosized because of good works they did and some other reasons. Chinese also believed in the Buddhism, so Buddhas and Bodhisattvas got all mixed up with these spirits. Uh, and they provided a path for Buddhist believers through the spirit world to the other side, right? Um, the Cheng Teng put the Bodhisattva Guanyin in the center, as you, most of you know. Uh, on the side was the, the Empress of Heaven, Chen Ho. And she was a popular deity in South China and all over the Southeast Asian world. She was uh, associated with trade and fishermen, and boats, and the sea. Uh, so uh, then she was also called Mazu, probably most of you know. And then on the other side was the local deity, right? The Dapo. And 
uh, going home. So there were three are there, and they combine all these different religious and spiritual ideas from a Chinese perspective. So they are the ones who, in the Chengdu case, looked after the descendants of the ancestors, ancestral tablets that were kept in that temple, and they protected them against all the evil, demonic influences of the spirit world. Manifest, of course, as human problem. Now, the Hong Kong procession itself was an imperial inspection tour. Uh, the term is Tai Tian Shun Shou. You see the characters in this. Uh, this was very ancient idea. So, never mind what the particular cult is or the particular school and in religion, very uh, old idea. The idea is the ruler of the world has fearsome power. Fearsome power, but also charisma. And the charisma of the ruler depends on the extension of his authority and peace and prosperity. So peace and prosperity gave the ruler his charisma. And he then could send inspectors down to see that nobody's interrupting the peace and prosperity. This was a secular political idea. It was also a religious idea because beyond the ruler is heaven. And heaven is the place whose power extends to life and death and illness and well-being and things we can't control, the non-human spiritual world. So Tai Tian Shun Shou took on the meaning of representative not of the emperor, but of heaven itself. And this is a complex thing. Now, the next thing is the Taoist ritual. This event had Taoist priests performing rituals. Uh, these are called Jia. And in the Hokkien dialect, they say Chou which means to have a ritual that is a purification. And no matter what the deities are in the temple, it's the same Taoist priests who are going to come and perform these rituals. So you have temples with different deities, and you have Taoist priests that are now hired from Muar and come down and do these rituals in all the temples, right? So in the in uh, Hokkien or Fujian, the performance of the Jiao ritual was called Chou Chou. And one type of this ritual was a performance that was performed only rarely and not in the annual cycle. So the local temples will have regular kind of rituals performed on certain days of the year, but it's a kind of ritual that's performed only rarely, and sometimes five years, sometimes ten years, sometimes more. And that is a rather grand ritual. Okay. So this, such a ritual, is what the Wang Kong was. So it began as a Jiao uh, ritual performance of that type, not a regular uh, one anyway. Now, the Ongya were from the popular tradition along the Hokkien or Fujian coast. So starting probably around late 1500s, early 1600s. So they, we don't really have ongyas. We have things that look like ongyas. We have boats going out. We have uh, all kinds of different sorts of cults with people doing similar things. But the actual ongyas uh, began to get their temples around 15, early 1600s. And they spread gradually. The ongyas were kings. The term means king. Um, and they were originally in life uh, they were local deities originally, and they joined a pantheon of a whole bunch of them, there were 360 of them. There's a folk tale that makes these spirits, these kings, victims of an emperor who tried to uh, undermine the Taoist priesthood, and he got the most important Taoist priest to come to the temple. And anyway, many stories of this. What happened was he was using these important officials to try to uh, prove that the Taoist priest didn't have magic. Well, the Taoist priests had the magic, and they all died, and their spirits went out, came back, and went out, came back, and eventually the emperor had to, in heaven, had to recognize these spirits as uh, important dead people who are not of the officials, and they're going to come down and do these, uh, uh, these imperial inspection tours, right? Now, so that's a particular kind of religious activity that was popular. That is, it came really up from the people, and all the stories came up from these little communities. Um, they were generally identified with local places, local temples uh, in South China. Now, 
in the processions that they perform. There might be just one of them, there might be three of them, there might be five of them, sometimes even more. But one, three, and five. So temples would get together and have a procession, and it wouldn't be every year, but it would be in a local place, uh, and they would cooperate together. So in Malacca, in the beginning, we don't know how many old notes in there, but by the 1860s, it was the Bandahalir Temple, the Yong Trintian, that became the central one because he invited, the deity invited the Chu Ongya to come from Kandao, and he would be the host. We'll see that has something to do with geography, right? Okay. By 1905, there were five Ongyas, and again in 1919, again in 1933, there were five Ongyas. So this became standard. Now, the last thing, the Chinese. So these folks, sometimes, in different kinds of vessels, uh, 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 even that are not home yet, they train sailors. So the sailors go in front of the boat. And you'll find in Fujo, for example, there's a very different kind of temple where the sailors are out there. And the sailors are young men who are trained by their temples and they're trained to check certain things, and they have oars, and they go, and they proceed in front of some kind of a boat. The boats very often are very small. They're made of paper and bamboo and things. The sailors are the young men of the temple, right? And we know the young men of the temple too, right? So they go out, and they make all this noise. So that is part of the tradition. In Malacca, there were 40 such sailors, and they marched in front of the ship. And the sailors in, yeah, so I missed this. So, they were selected by divination, right? So if you have a lot of people that want to be sailors, and you do, because a very young man want to be one of these sailors, right? That doesn't happen very often. Then you're chosen by divination. So you drop the blocks at the temple, they come up this way or this way, and it determines whether you're chosen or not. And in the end, 40 or 36 are chosen, 36 boys, and then there are four older men that act as, they're called the heads, and the boys are called the feet, and they march in a procession. Um, and we'll see a picture in a minute. So, the name for China, that's the curious one. This is derived from a uh, kind of traditional verse. And the story, the verses, are about the young maidens who are plucking lotus flowers, right? That's what it means. Taiyan means to pluck a lotus flower. Now, how this becomes the name of the guys who are walking along is a mystery. But probably, after all, the people who are doing this, they don't speak Chinese really. So Chinese is fine. That's a name for a person. If you look at it in Chinese, that's not a person. It's an act. It's picking, plucking the, the lotus flower. So but there were lots of verses about the maidens plucking lotus flowers. And the verse that they're singing in Malacca uh, describes a boat of immortals. It doesn't say only us. It's a boat of immortals. It's not called the one kind, it's a boat of immortals. But the song that comes from somewhere in China is a verse about these immortals floating along down the stream, and probably they see the maidens plucking the flowers, right? And so the idea is that they're making the demons that of the rivers stay away from these maidens for next So it's like evil and purity, right? So the image of the, that comes from the poems is an image that has a symbolic meaning that is just we need to purify ourselves and restore um, uh, morally and spiritually the people. So just to avoid the evil influence except for the All right, so the grass, the verse, the grass, the chain of performers, it may have come from the city of Trendo, but I don't think there's any ultimate proof of that. Um, but similar things are seen there, and so it's kind of a still a mystery of life. Now, so finally we get here, and how long have I been talking? 25 minutes. Okay, my clock is wrong, thank you. So finally, we need to understand how the state treated religious practices, right? It's an important part now of the environment. So here you see the Chinese Qing government and the British colonial government, a different approach. In China, the imperial government tended to recognize certain gods. So 
the imperial government with its authority would get applications and it would say, okay, we will accept this and then we standardize to see it. So deities like the, the, the uh, what do we call it, the, the, the uh, Empress of Heaven was standardized. And she's quite okay. Uh, and other deities like that, right? But some others were not. Others were considered superstitious and heterodox extravagant, wasteful, exploitative of the people, right? The Hongyans were not officially authorized. So they were a late religion, and the government did not operate. The British idea, well, the British colonial government from Syria, the British idea was a liberal one. So that meant we tolerate all the religions, and anybody who knows anything about India knows what the British wanted to do is stay out of the religious kind of problems of the Hindus and the Muslims. So they say, okay, we tolerate all religions, but you know, we are Christian. So what they do is they want to educate people for a civil society. That's going to be secular. And the other religions, we tolerate them. But of course, their Christian virtues and Christian values, they think underlie the civil virtues that will eventually educate people to participate. So that was their idea. Um, and so fundamentally, Christian virtues versus non-Christian superstition, but we tolerate all the superstition. So that's it. So now, these are the bits and pieces. Um, we'll look at some visual evidence now, where we're going to think about what's happening in three major periods. So before the British came, and then after the, while the British are here in the early period, and while it's about their developing, the society developing, and then finally in 1905 to 1933. In the middle period, this is when all the Malacca successful business networks, Singapore are getting rich, coming back, and putting their money back into Malacca. They're also putting their money into Singapore, and it's the same name. So one thing I could do is look at the Chinese inscriptions of temples and cemeteries and things. Same names, Singapore and Malacca. So this is an old Malacca elite doing this. Uh, so that's going on at that time. At the same time, lots of immigration, right? Coming directly from China. So the new Chinese are coming at the same time. Um, then finally, 1905, 1933, we have the rubber boom, and Malacca starts to really prosper, and the population starts to really grow, and the wealth really expands, and now we have reformers building schools, we have revolutionaries in China who are talking together with Chinese here. So it becomes a very different world, a very complex, different world. And we're going to look at uh, the meaning uh, in that context. Okay, so now I spent all that time in the boring part. There's no some picture. So just to introduce the idea of different meanings, this, unbelievably, is uh, uh, an etching, a graphic, uh, from the Daily Graphic in London in 1891. And this one, a company, was made by a famous engraver, and it accompanied an article that was written by the wife of the uh, acting resident of Malacca in 1891, when there was a big festival, uh, a big uh, thing. So it's called Casting Out Demons in Malacca. And uh, that's the first one I'm going to show you. And so it's an English artist's idea of what this thing was about, based on an article written by the English resident's wife about what happened. And so this is the, the vision he comes up with. Now, if we look carefully, you can look at the representation of the Chinese. You can look at the, here's the boat, it's burning. And this, I guess, is the spirit being exercised, right? So. The point to keep in mind is here is this very superstitious event taking place um, in this view. And it's the eye of the reader, the eye of the beholder of what this, uh, the reader of what, what the beholder saw. So, what were the actual performers doing and what did they mean? Okay, the second one I'm going to show you is from 1934. Anybody was here last year, you all saw this. 1934, this is Yankee, Yankee Leon, or Yankee Leon. He's a famous cartoonist uh, in Malacca, and he likes the lampoon and everything. So his idea is, oh look, here's what all the Chinese are saying about the Wangkan. It is to get rid of the ills of the world, right? So the one idea, the English 
Chinese superstition. Get rid of the elves of the world is an exercise of demons. This jumpster is saying, all the Chinese really care about getting rich, right? <laughs> so they want to do, have this ceremony, and then everybody's going to be prosperous, and we'll be better off, and that's how we get rid of the, of the ills of the world. But this reflects a lot of stuff that was in the newspapers and what people were talking about, right? Uh, and Yankee Yong is from Malacca. He really loves all this, right? But he's making, he's not doing it anyway. So, uh, now, another little joke may be, and I just learned this, because I don't have a leg. That thing is called a Wang Kong, right? If it's called a Wang Kong in Malay, it could mean the money boat. Right? Wang, money, boat, Hong Kong, Wang Kong. So if we look at it again, we'll see what we get. See, it's a money boat. Right. Now, we cut a little on and uh, about halfway through. So now, I'm going to introduce some photos. These photos, now I'm just experimenting. I got these photos from Audrey Lynn and from Daniel. I am not here, but it's Oh, Daniel's here. OK. Now we got some questions. Uh, there are lots of questions about these photos. Is it 1933? Is it 1918? They think it's 1933. But anyway, quickly we're going to go through the photos, and then we're going to come back to them later. But here, I want you to notice, here is the Hong Kong coming out of the shed where it was built. And here is the Dai Tian Shu Shou, that means the inspection tour. Um, and we're going to now, that's, that's it coming out, so we're beginning to have this actual procession. This is a photograph of the Chinese, <coughs> that is the sailors. They are not in their dress yet. So they're in formal dress. And this dress was used for rehearsal, all white pants, shirts, and sashes. And there's formally posing for this photograph. Now, this was from Chen Yulok's wall. Chen Yulok was a little boy, 11 years old, in 1933, who told us, he's now passed away, right? Chen Yulok. And he told us that, oh, when he was 11 years old, he really wanted to be a Chinese. He so much wanted to be a Chinese. And he went and he did the divination, he dropped the blocks, but it didn't come out. So he didn't get to be a Chinese. And he remembers that as you know, a real moment in his life. But he has this photograph up here uh, on his wall. So there were over 100 boys nominated. Only 36 of them actually get to carry the patents, right? Um, okay. and now, <clears throat> this is a photo. Now again, question. Is this 1919 or is this 1933? I think it's 1933. So there's the shed again. See, they build a shed at that shed and they build the boat inside of it. And it comes out for two days of parading all around the city. Um, and so we see these guys, I counted them. There are 45 guys in costume. Four have drums, six have, and there are six small ones in front, which leaves 35 with paddles. So somebody must have been on sick. I think there should be 36 with paddles. There are only 35 as far as I can count them. So somebody was out sick, I didn't tell us. But these are the guys who are gonna chant the verse. Now notice uh, you can't see too well what these costumes look like. They got these big hats, uh, tall hats, funny hats, and uh, fancy embroidery on the costume. Now we'll come back to this. Now here, again, this is Audrey Lin's photo. We're talking about. Um, he was the possession of China and actually forming, I believe. I don't know exactly where it is, but that's what it looked like. So here are the 36 China boys in costume, and they're under a canopy, and they'll be preceded by the guys who are called the heads, they're the feet. These guys are the feet. Well, if you think of these as feet, and the guys in front as heads, you kind of see like a double-headed, like, I don't know, centipede or dragon in this thing. So it's all connected. Why the canopy overhead? But that's what they actually look like in the procession. Here they are going through the street of Malacca. I can't tell you where this is. But uh, you can't see the design or the color of the costume here. And this we yeah, have Daniel to thank for actually providing some costumes that we can actually look at the colors and think about it, right? So they all look white, but uh, these are the Chinese in their procession, okay? We'll come back to them. And this is the ultimate picture. We can see some color. So these guys, the Chinese, this is, hello, so these two men are, Roland. 
uh, the wealthy babas and Nonya families putting all their wealth on display, and the young people from the family riding on these floats. They look like that. <coughs> right? But in the line of march, this march is supposed to be two miles long. Everybody's saying at least two miles uh, in this procession. So in the two miles of procession, it was more than just these guys. A lot of these. Now here's another one. You know, sitting in display um, of the wealth and the grandeur. Again, another one. <coughs> you notice the people hanging out of the windows. Uh, place was very crowded, and you also notice that the people are not all Chinese, so the whole city is pouring out uh, to see this pageant. Now, I'll ask the question, <clears throat> is this from 1933 or not? And we're not sure. <laughs> this could be something else, right? But this is very definitely Chinese, not Baba. That is, this is like new Chinese. This one, I've already had Bert tell me, no, 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 no way. Is this the Wang Kang parade? This is something else. This one, nobody knows what this is. Okay? So th but these are the kind of photographs we have as evidence to play with to figure out uh, who's doing what. And what about this one? Does anybody recognize this? This banner? Anybody in the room? Yes. It's like all righteous way to rest. Okay. All right. See? Not. <laughs> Not 1933. And so it's dark and the, and the dress is different. Okay. But again, people are very used to seeing processions in the street. The 1933 pageant was super. Now here's the Capitol Theater, which the last time I went by was ruined. I'm very unhappy about that. There's a ruin. And here are the floats coming by. But again, you notice all the people hanging out of the theater watching the floats. And finally, the Wang Kong Festival itself comes by. Uh, and uh, we're going to run out of time. So here is the Wang Kong vessel going by the Capitol Theater. So it went around in 1933 on two days, the day in between of rest, all over the city. So the idea of a pageant and a spectacle, I said 100,000 people came from all over, that there were a, and all the Chinese from all over are coming to Malacca for this, you know. There's a grand tour to this. But in a minute we're going to think about, like, what are some of the subtext going on. But this was really a grand pattern. Okay. Now, those are basic pieces, and now we're going to go back to the boring part. That is, um, what were the origins in, what was the context of the origins of this thing? Okay? So, one important part of the context involved these Malacca Chinese in 1800. Who were they verbally? So first thing, you can see here three places, the three main places that they came from. There were only maybe a thousand Chinese living in Malacca at that time, and not really very many people at all. There was only Chinese, a lot of them. There had only been a couple thousand together, but a lot went to Penang, right, before Singapore opened. So now, they come from these places especially, this is what we call Angkun here. Trendo, I don't know exactly what your pronunciation. Uh, okay, and Zhangdo is Zhangdu, right? So, and Zhangdo is divided into different parts, and the people come from those different parts don't necessarily get along. So, there are all these different origins of people. Um, but remember, um, in Malacca, we're going to see in a minute, these people who went up to Singapore, those families, they all intermarried. It didn't matter where they came from. So that's going to be a key part of the story. Now, <clears throat> so when the British came, what happened? Yeah. London Missionary Society also came. That's important because I'm going to tell this other little story about the mystery that I have. So the London Missionary Society was not exactly the Anglican Church. These are the people who want to go out and be missionaries in the world. And they're kind of broken with the Anglican Church. So they came early, 1811. By 1818, they had established an Anglo-Chinese college. Have you heard of that one? Yes. Here? OK. The Anglo-Chinese college also spawned uh, preparatory schools. So there were primary schools. There were four of them with a lot of Chinese kids. There were six of them. 
Yeah, but in, in already in 1920s, there were already four, and one of those was in Kanda. The other three were in the city, okay? So these schools were educating Chinese boys and some of the boys in English. I guess where they took that, right? They took it to Singapore. So that's going on. And at the same time, so a lot of the families then, they said, people went off to Singapore, but they have somebody behind them. So somebody behind takes care of the property or whatever, and that's the story. Now, I want to put this slide up. Way too much detail, you don't spend time on it. But these people are the ones that were the big elite of the Malacca elite in the early 19th century. I want you to notice that Milby Hawk was the first, in 1824, the British were in control, right? Milby Hawk was the first temple chairman at the Chen Hung Tang. His, he was married to a sister of Si Hu Ti. Si Hu Ti was the second of the managers of the temple, second of the committee chairman. Si Hu Ti himself was married to a daughter of Tan Hei Kwan. Tan Hei Kwan was the ancestor of Tan Chang Lao. So there's another whole family there. And these are the ones, one of Singapore. So this one became, this family became a big shipping magnate, right? Um, this one went off, became a big property owner, the Z. He also had a daughter who married Tan Beng Sui. Tan Beng Sui was the son of Tan Kim Seng, who was the third head of the Ching Hung Tang Temple. <coughs> and he himself, <coughs> here's that marriage, he himself had a paternal aunt who was from the Lee family, right? So these people are related. Then another daughter of Si Hu Ki married Li Kui Yin, and that's the famous Li Tang. He said it's it, right? And so all these, now we just go down the line, and it goes on and on and on, right? We want you to notice, it, here's the Qi, here is a, a Yo family that I have yet to figure out exactly who all the Yo people are. Here's Tan Tok Seng's family, and uh, so on and so on. Now, they're all born during this time, but you see their ancestry traced to different places. And one important thing to realize is that Enkun, Yongchun, didn't have any Ongyans. No Ongyans in Yongchun. And they tell stories, why don't we have Ongyans? Because we have this black-faced God who takes them all away and he's scared. But remember, Enkun or Yongchun is a little more inland. So it's not right next to the sea. So Chenzhou and Dongzhou are the places where the Ongyans come from, but where precisely? It didn't matter. The point is, it didn't matter to these people because they were all Malacca. They're thinking, we are the Malacca Chinese. We stay behind. We now uh, take up, uh, over the temple and we go to Singapore. We make all the money and we come back and we power back into these places. Okay. Now there's a mystery that I have uncovered recently with the help of all my friends, especially Colin Go and her and other people. And there goes the story yesterday, right? So uh, this one is that the missionaries built a chapel in Malacca. It's a kind of forgotten. Nobody remembers the chapel. You remember the chapel. Oh, good. <laughs> Nobody else remembers the chapel. So the thing is, when the missionaries came, there was Christ Church. It was not yet Christ Church. Christ Church was Dutch Reformed Church. So the Anglicans, now we're British, the Anglicans had no place to worship. So they wanted to have the Christ Church. But they didn't get Christ Church until 1930, or 1838. So in between time, 1820s, the missionaries were the chapel. The chapel, the story of the chapel is told in a few places. And one of the places is Munchi Abdullah told the story. And his story is that he helped the missionaries get this property. And the property was right across the street from the Chenghong Temple, and the Chinese were really mad about it. Okay, so this story goes on. It's very complicated. But what I want to say is, what happened? The Chenghong Teng itself was supposed to be protecting all the Chinese uh, and the Chinese ancestors, right? The ancestor worship is very important. The ancestors are buried from Bukit China, aren't they? Here's Bukit China over here. Um, 
Here is the Jango Dango over here. <coughs> now, they built a Christian chapel across the street from the place. And it's interfering with the feng shui. Okay? It's interfering with the spiritual power of the temple. Now, Muchi Abdullah said he heard from the Chinese at the temple that this was the case. Right? <coughs> interfering with it. Okay. So let's have a look. Meanwhile, on this same map is the Yongchuan Den. This is where the uh, Ongyans are come from now. <coughs> But he wasn't around yet. It comes later, right? So let's now go on. Here's a closer view, but this is a better one, right? Right here. What is that? This is where the stage is for the Cheng Hunde across the street. And unless I'm wrong, looking at the documents from the temple, let's say this was somehow came to the temple before 1860. So in 1843, the missionaries left because they're going to China, right? What had happened? The opium war. So the missionaries, the London Missionary Society, wanted to go to China all the time. They were only here treading water, right? They educated the Malacca Tokes in English, and then as soon as China opened, off they went. What they're going to do with the chapel? They gave the chapel to trustees to take care of it. And the trustees were the trustees of the Dutch Reformed Church. In 1843, the trustees of the Dutch Reformed Church had not yet given the property to the Anglican Church. So the Christ Church was now the place where the Anglicans were having the ceremony, but the trustees had not yet given the property. Just at that moment, 1843, that's when the missionaries signed the order for these trustees. Now, all we know is that by 1862, the temple had it, right? But there was quite a bit of a noise about it. So I want us to remember these dates because this is precisely the time that also the Wang Kong case starts, right? So here is the view from the temple. If you stand across the street from the Cheng Hung Teng, this is what, if you were in the chapel, this is what you would see, right? And you wouldn't like the noise, and you wouldn't like the incense, <coughs> and you wouldn't like all the devil worship. And then if you sit in the temple and look across the street, there's the stage. That would be with where the chapel was. Now, I'm pretty sure that this is the case. Because the Chinese said, what was the temple said? The problem is this chapel is breaking the spiritual power of the temple. So all of us who went off to Singapore, we prospered. But all the new Chinese who are coming, now, there's not 1,000, but maybe 4,000, or maybe 5,000. All these new people, they're having a hard time prospering. They say, and it's, maybe it's because of that uh, Christian chapel. Okay? All right, moving on. So, it's a very interesting story. And now we come to, let's go back again to 1847. So. In 1847, the Chang Wen Tang was having trouble, right? And at the same time, these people in Kandao, which is way over here, look how far away. The people in Kandao who are related, some of them related to people who went off to Singapore came back. Which ones? Ang family, the Chong family, right? Are probably the devotees of this little Chu Ong Yang. Somebody in Kanda has this two and they've had him for a very long time, but they don't have a temple, right? So what happened in 1847 is the Cheng Wen leaders and the, the ones from Singapore came back and they sponsored the temple. And they made a lot of money and the temple got attached to the Cheng Wen all in 1848. And now we have a temple in Kanda and the deity in the temple is an Ong Yang for the first time, right? Okay. Now, uh, moving on, we don't have a lot of time. Here is the front of the Cheng Wen Tang today. <clears throat> this is the temple in, in Kandang, way out in the country. And Daniel told me all the stories about growing up there in the 1980s. It was still a town home, right? So, and he also grew up in Heron Street, so he can tell you those stories, right? So here in street is one thing, and the compound is another thing. Imagine 150 years earlier, <laughs> right? Uh, that was really the compound. So the Babas 
and the Malays share the compound, but Babas probably own the land, and the Malays are working for this right. But this is the this is the thing. If you look at the inscriptions, the Chinese inscriptions, it tells you who all the donors were, and you see the names of local people that are a little hard to sort out, and you see the names of all the wealthiest uh, New Singapore's Malacca and Chinese, right? So this was uh, a joint venture, if you will. This is uh, actually Chu uh, Ongyang this week. I went out there, and you see he should be up here, but they're repainting, they're renovating the altar, so instead he's down here, and look what he's sitting at. He's sitting on the altar, and right here it says, what does it say? Dai Chu Cho, right? Inspection tour. And over here, you can't quite see, it says, the Chinese, 1933. The date, 1933, is written in the 22nd year of the Chinese Republic. Right? It's a very Chinese name. And over here is the name of the firm, the corporation, that received it, received the gift of this. This is the altar that's going to go out, I think, and take it down to Bondavir, I think. And who received it, there is a chalk one here that has a Chong surname on it. Right? So, All right, so that tells us something about the temple. I'm not going to bore you with this one, but look, here's what happened. From 1848 to 1933, uh, here's what you can find in sources, English language newspapers, about the actual Wangkong. You don't see the word Wangkong used in the English sources until 1905. Now, please, Somebody do the research, find earlier references to the word Wangkam applied to this ceremony. What you have here is you have a boat to the immortal, an immortal's boat. The song, remember, talks about the immortal's boat. Uh, in 1869, we know definitely the procession had become much bigger, the performance. We're now beginning, including all of Malacca and it migrated from Kanda. The newspapers call it the Chayan procession. In 1880, they referred to a sacred junk procession. Uh, in 1905 and 1891, there was a big cholera outbreak, and there's a story about renewal of the procession because they had let it. They were bad. They didn't do it. It's been a long time. They said, now we're having cholera, we're having economic problems, you got to have this procession. Still, they didn't call a long time in the reports that you can see in English. And there are no Chinese. The Chinese report is in a Chinese newspaper, which they call it uh, some deity in some Malacca temple, and they call it a spirit boat, right? A spirit boat. So they're not calling it a long time, a long time. 1905, it's transformed. Suddenly, it's a long time festival. They call it a day festival. And so everybody's coming from Singapore, and now it's like 1933, right? Everybody's showing off, lots of them. And so what would you imagine all the reformers among the Babas in Singapore, they're saying, well, this is okay, this is our tradition, blah, blah. On the other hand, it's a big waste of money. All this money being wasted. We shouldn't have these things, we shouldn't have any chingays at all, because to waste all that money, we should be putting in education and educating girls and whatnot, right? So there were arguments. The meaning was shifting rapidly. It was now a grand chingay procession, and a lot of people were opposed to it because it was very graceful. Not the government, but uh, Bob was upset. So then by the time we get, here comes one, thank you, Bert. In Kuching, there was one uh, festival also that by 1918 was called the Wangkong Festival. And, uh, and so we have this record of a few of those before 1919, and then I knew Okay. So, People made a lot, in 1933, they say the world is, you know, in very great distress. Uh, the Japanese have taken over Manchuria. Uh, Hitler is rising. Uh, there has been a great depression. The British are not so strong anymore. Uh, and so all these problems, the lovers not doing too well, but we're recovering. So all these things are mentioned. 
in relation to the Wonton. Maybe, you know, this will, people believe in it, maybe it will help. Big collaboration with this, right? So, in 1933, and here, I'm just gonna put these out and not babble on. This was an article in the Straits Times <coughs> describing the actual event. Um, and it begins with the short ceremony to rid the world of many ills. And this is how it was, right? And uh, you can read about it. This is just the beginning. But that's the lead. But here is the beginning of the article. You can notice it says, essentially Chinese festival. <coughs> Celebrate Hong Kong here today. It's caught the imagination of all the races. This is the key thing. There's striking testimony to the belief that of all the towns in modern Malaya, Old World Malacca is the most Malayanized. Right? What do you mean by Malayanized? Well, <coughs> the governor, who is Cecil Clementi, has been arguing we need a policy of Malayanization for Malaya. What did it mean? So he said that, oh, this is a prime example of Malayanization. Because all the races get along together, there's all the Malays are out on the hill celebrating this pageant, and so it's really a big collective thing, and that's what I mean by Malayanization. The Malacca Guardian published an editorial because they have asked for the governor's opinion. The governor put it, they put it in the very front of this, the Malacca Guardian memento they published on the day of the event. And the very first thing in it is Governor Clemente's praise of Malacca for being the most Malayan All Right, so, but the editorial is a little more guarded. It says, well, so we know, therefore, that because he says this, the government must mean, and so on, right? So they're interpreting. The thing that becomes an interpretation of what I mean by Malayan is it only like the idea, but, Certainly, he must mean that it also is a recognition of the service, the Leonization of service. So he says, you know, the Chinese of Malacca have been great contributors to this great nation. And therefore, I'm sure that the government must mean that we recognize this great service. And that would mean for the Chinese of that time that sponsors the education and allows the Chinese to have a voice in the government. And then here you can see, uh, the following spring, February, and Tanakh is tearing on this idea of the Malayanization. He says, it can only mean everybody loyal to Malay, and if it could possibly mean that everybody has to become Malay, that's not just the Chinese thing. So there's an argument going on, and right in the middle of it comes this festival, and everybody's interpreting the festival, and it has all these different meanings, right? So. That's how far we got with it. Now, this one? This one before that? Take a photo. This is uh, on November 27, 1933. It's the day of the first, uh, of the first uh, procession, the two day procession. Huh? The next one. This one. So this is from. Uh, February 1934. So that's, the idea of Malayanization, that's what they were arguing about. As for the <laughs> festival, everybody who's talking about the festival says, oh, this represents the future of Malaya. So the, the Chinese are thinking about what will, the, what will be the future of Malaya, they're thinking in 1933. Okay? I hope this will be symbolic of what the future should be. That is to say, you know, we can be essentially Chinese, the Babas are becoming more Chinese, <coughs> the Chinese are becoming more Malayan, and that's going to be the culture will remain absolutely central, and all the cultures will collaborate together, and we will have one Malaya, and we will all be loyal to the same country. That's our wish for the future. That's what people were saying with the, is one of the means. On the ground level, this one of the meanings is still, let's show off all our wealth and have a great passion. Another meaning is, the donkeys are representing the voice of the Ongyas, and, <coughs> and I'm going to pray at the temple, and I'm hoping that I don't die next year, and so on. So all these layers of meaning were all So it went on longer than I meant to, but I was uh, 
we can, if we like, we can go back and look at photos and think about them, or we can look at Daniel's costumes. We can make, do you want to actually break, or do you want to raise some questions? Here's the costume. And for Daniel, I'm going to have questions about exactly which costume you pick. They're very different. They're very different. They have different design, slightly different. The stitching is different. The latches on them are different. Uh, quite a lot of difference in uh, And here are some examples of differences in this. So one of the questions I had about the costumes, are these costumes being made? Were these costumes being made at home? by individual family? And if so, how much variation could they have? And if not, are these two pieces that Daniel Brophy represented are from two different 1919 to 1933? Right? So this pattern here, the one of the, the, the pink one, looks like this. This is the light pink with a dark, a dark um, trim. So that looks very much like this, pink with the green trim. So I would go with that. Then what's the other one? Then the last thing I'm going to look at. You see the difference here? Different class. This one is a different kind of class. And then also the stitching. Um, there's a detail of the stitching. This one has four layers and it's much more complex. So these are definitely made by different people. So why? It's a different time or different families. Here's the sash. It's not the sash. Right? Different sash. So this is the sash, I think. It goes with this outfit and not with this outfit, right? So we can look at that, take it back, ask people, but, right? This one is 1930. This is Chen Yulok's program on his wall. So anything? Questions, thoughts, comments? Your own things? Sorry? Okay, does anybody know when the next Hong Kong festival is? See, I don't go there. I'm the historian. I stopped in 1933. I stopped in 1933. Some people would say there hasn't been a Hong Kong festival. And other people would say, uh, in 2001, 2012, there was a Hong Kong festival. Yeah, so I don't, that's, that's for, that's for local people to fight over. But I would say, uh, anyway, it's quite different, quite different. What do you want to see or talk about? Wow. With that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, questions. The floor is now open to questions. Well, do you or you can, or we can break off and if you have questions or something you want to look at, you can come up. What would you like to do? Quiet. We're like my students. <laughs> so I hope. You no, know, I really hope. I'm not I get involved in this stuff. I really hope that people will make an effort to find out more. You learn a little bit. You know that there are photos. You know that there are questions that are answered. You go home. You know, you find the old folks. You ask them. You make them write things down. You get in the drawers. You find things. You Google. You go online. You know, our friend Bird. He's the one, he's the Sarawak expert, he don't want to say. 
He's the one who finds stuff in Putin, right? He just goes and looks, he finds stuff online, yeah? Ask questions. The thing is, you have to ask questions about the stuff. Why it is? Who said that, right? When is this actually a picture? Uh, and then you have to go from there. And when you do that, you get more and more into it, and it becomes more your heritage, right? And it's everybody's heritage in Malacca, oh, this one. So, uh, you know, I encourage people. Now, you will not fight over, you know, the names. Yeah. Kate. My name is Irene. We have met. I used to be with the Chippewa Museum. So I, I'm very interested in this history. But I also know Chinese. So there are many temples that celebrate the Kolichi Huang Ye, which is the nine Prince of Heaven uh, in Chinese. But I noticed that you have one that was Chu Huang Ye, that means a Chu family, and another one, Ti Huang Ye. Yeah. So I do not know whether, and this started, uh, this practice started during Taoist time. That means before Tang Dynasty, way, way long ago. And it was something to do with the cantillation in heaven. The stars are in line, and they have to have a big, big ceremony because heaven was coming down to inspect mm -hmm. the earth. That was a long time ago. But it started off as uh, Jiu Wang Ye. That is the name of that heavenly god. But I noticed later on it became the Chu family and the Ti family Huang Ye. Mm -hmm. So I do not know whether Malaccans have made it into a family thing because I know that there are some temples which is not the one in uh, Tanka, is it? Kandang, mm -hmm. not the one in Kandang yeah. that celebrate this in a very big way, yeah. very Taoist way. Right. So I do not know whether there's a difference or there is a mixture or it got very localized. That's a very good question and uh, I think, you know, first of all, what you find is, if you start researching the Ongyas, then you, there's a temple in Trento yes. that has what? One seven or something. Yes. All these Ongyas are one temple. Yes. That doesn't make any sense. Yes. Why are the Ongyas in one temple in Trento? Yes. Yeah, because I think you can imagine the city fathers in Trento trying to corral all this stuff and bring all the Ongyas into one temple. Mm -hmm. And then they have a big festival. So that's it. As I understand it, the Trento Temple was the one that built the big boat, wooden boat, and they floated out to sea. And so a lot of the uh, Wang Fans and Hongya temples in Taiwan, they, some of them say, well, you know, this boat actually reached Taiwan. And so we have the Hongyans here from that. So that's one of the legends. On the other hand, you go to local stories, you can find a, a story about the true Hongya, who, which is very different from the general one, and it's in a particular place in Gangdo. And then the Ti Ongya, there's a temple, and now everybody says, that's the original one, right? And that's in Xiaoman. So they say, this is the oldest one. This is the original Ti Ongya temple. But then you have to think that they are, each temple has its own identity with that particular character, right? But then the story of 360 Ongya, uh, that's a completely different one, right? So if you, um, I think what matters is this icon I you from Kandam, that's the thing, right? The little statue came from somewhere. So that could, wherever that came from, it's somebody bringing the statue that's from their native place. They don't have a temple, but they keep it for a long time. And then finally, it's sponsored the temple, now you can think, oh, where does it come from and how is it related to all the other ones, right? So I, 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 I encourage you, <laughs> I worry that the more, the deeper you get, the more confusing it will be to tell. I'm sorry, Jerry, I'm a bit late. I didn't catch the fun part, but uh, to what I would say, I think you uh, need to know that they are the five onyas and they are the nine onyas and they're not the same. They're not the same group of uh, onyas, okay? So the five onyas uh, basically in Kandang, in uh, Bandai Kile, in Jungle Street, you know, that's where their temples are. 
the on Yakong is only the one in Bacham. The entirely different group of Omyas. And I think the Omyas is also the different of different yeah. Even if you go to some place where they have five Omyas, it's a festival. They won't have the same name. That's the one here. So they can be, but if you look at which individual Omyas are the most popular, then you find T Omya. There are more T Omya than anything else. But especially in Taiwan, right? Yeah, and the other thing I want to tell you that the Chu Ongya is not the family name. You know, it's not Chu. Yes, it was written in Chinese. I know it's written in Chinese as Chu, but it's not Chu of a family. It's the name of that Ongyas, okay? So the five Ongyas, the celebrations are always during the Chinese New Year, the 15th day of the Chinese New Year, the first month. And the Tao Omya celebrations are always on the ninth month. <coughs> there's always that weak thing, you know, of fasting and all very white. So there are two entirely different groups of celebration. So that answers my question. Yeah. That means the original heavenly calculation king that marks that day mm. that in, in the Tao, Taoist belief mm. is different from all these localized uh, Wang Yas, that means there are five. So any family can have one of these deities well, and celebrate they're not it family. differently. They're not family. But they came from somewhere that has a surname of T no, or Chu. No, no, it's no, it's a no, surname. No. You, you see, yeah. I maybe can't help with you. <laughs> but the, <laughs> the, because the Wang Yas are community, they belong to a temple. If a family actually controls the temple, the Ongya doesn't have the name of the family. The Ongya, because the Ongya has to have a story of his own. That to be a Ongya, to be a god, a deity, you know, you have to have a story. So one of the stories is they all became Ongyas at the same time. Some people say in the Tang Dynasty, some in the Ming Dynasty, it has to be the Tang Dynasty. So they say there were 360 officials. That's one of the stories, right? But local stories will often say, okay, this guy with this name, he was an official in way back, you know, Jin time, an official in Tang time or something, and he had a name. So they'll say he was the actual guy. And then they'll find him in the local, they'll find him in the local gazetteer. Say that was the official. He did something good. So he became a spirit. That's one way of explaining why we have a spirit with that name. Because it's the name of the official. So I think you may be finding also that some families who have those names, they may be saying, relating their family to that same official. But all these things get constructed later, right? So I think it, it, it's not really, they're not really the family names. These ones, any of the whole network, they're not really the family of the people that might be saving the thing. They belong to something bigger. Let me represent heaven to come and do this. Right, right. That's a very good name. The four words of you. Right. Any other questions or comments from the audience? Restless people. Or, or if you are like students nowadays, you can always approach him after. <laughs> I'm very approachable. <laughs> or if you want to see. Yeah. And please bring questions and come here. I understand. Like my students, you don't want to speak about it. But anyway, I mean about the multiplicity of these um, Ongya stories and, and traditions. It's we, because we have to remember that China is a, was a, I mean, is still is a very big place, and so um, whether there was an official um, Ongya story or which, which as uh, Professor Jerry has said, it was not. It was heterodox. It was not authorized. So, um, and what more if, if there was an imperial, like, officially sanctioned 
Hongya um, story or tradition, it would not always have caught on everywhere because it was a huge thing and and there would always be their local deities. I mean, we can see that even here, not only among the Chinese, you know, I mean, we have all the Pramats and local cults, um, local beliefs, these would all form and um, accumulate their own set of devotees, own set of tradition, stories, gods, um, and so on, and festivals. So uh, this would have given rise to all the, this, this different things. And the story of the 360 Omnas could also have been a later attempt to explain why there were so many of them. So I think that's, that's my opinion. Um, oh yes, okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks, it was really interesting. Uh, the part that I was quite interested on is the Malayanization. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it, the picture that I'm getting of the, the festival is it's very Chinese, um, but when it, uh, in 1933, was there more community involvement with the other communities, like the Indian and the Malay communities as well? And is that why, it's, or was it just because it was a street festival that I think it was mostly the pageantry, but people in 1933, people who are not Chinese, <coughs> are thinking about what is the future going to be. And so they're worried about Chinese being too Chinese because they're going to become revolutionary and they're going to join the Chinese, you know, and so on. And this is a very, but this is a very strictly Malacca and Malayan kind of event. And they're celebrating it as being very local. <coughs> so. And then the people who turn out, actually for the last several times, they're saying, you know, all the Malay people come in from all the kampong, and they sit around, and they enjoy the festival. So it's a festival that, and this was what the governor said, and other people said, it's essentially, he said, essentially Chinese, but it's a Malacca community festival. So the idea was that, everybody can appreciate. Now when they start talking about, well, what do they appreciate? <clears throat> and then you get people saying, you know, they're very religious people. Malacca people are very religious. It doesn't matter if they're Roman Catholics or Hindus or Muslim or what, very religious people. So they all appreciate everybody else's religion, right? And they say, here they are having this huge festival. I mean, because nobody got out there in the street and started fighting <laughs> over the Chinese right to take over the whole city, you know? And so it was, at one level, it's a Chinese way of marking the entire city as a Chinese city. It's the same thing in Penang, right? A huge festival, and they're sort of going around to all the corners, and they say, you know, it's, so, it's very much marking the city. You're not reminded, right? So that's what I think was the idea. And the other idea of Malayanization was the idea of education, which Clementi uh, had, which was entirely different. He says, we don't want to teach Chinese Chinese. We don't want to teach anybody English. But every, we want everybody to go to Malay schools and learn Malay, because that's the future of Malay. But that was being argued at the time. And the Chinese, of course, were all going to Chinese schools already and privately funded. So that was, that's the two sides. <coughs> I think of the argument. And I probably don't know any more about it. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question. Okay. Yeah. Come back to the history of Omiyas, right? Uh, if you take a look at it, there are 360 kings awarded by the emperor. Why is it true that it's all awarded as kids? I might have to have somebody re-speak your question because of the same. Is the history of four years. Altogether, there are 360, right? And well, that's a legend, yeah. Yeah, that's a legend. But why are they all awarded as kids? Why are they all what? Awarded as kids. Yes. Why would they be the Why would they yeah. Well, the story goes that you know the, the emperor was trying to fool the the, the Taoist priest. This is actually the master. So he had the Omyas 
uh, go to the below the palace, made a special room, and they're all down there playing this music. And uh, so the emperor told, this is, this is the story, right? The emperor told the priest, he said, well, this magic, you know, it's going to be. He said, I mean, you can't stop the music. And so the, that was, the priest goes, boom, boom, and they all died, right? So he says, oh gosh, it was a big mistake. So then they said, well, we're going to have to take them all and put the, send them out to sea. Because they're out to sea. And then they washed up ashore again, goes the story. When they washed up ashore, somebody opened the bucket with all the heads in. Boom, the spirits all went out. Now they're angry, right? They're like angry ghosts. And so the Taoist priest is called on again. If you do something with them, he says, okay, we'll make them all kings. We'll make them all princes. And then we'll give them duties to perform. So they will go down to the people and inspect. Right? So then they have that duty. That's the story. I've done. <laughs> yeah. What is what you see that's how we get hundred and eighty only up. Yeah. But according to your story, I think that is only called only up. Nine of them. That is why when every year they celebrate the call only up. They always put the, they don't show the, what do you call, the cake. They call this car home yard. They were all headless. Mm. You know the story began, that there was a very famous suit seer. I do not know the name, I forgot that. He could predict everything. So one day, the emperor wanted to test him whether he can predict so he asked, he ordered nine men to play music underneath the king, right underneath the castle. See? Yeah. So try to make as much noise as But then he called the, the soothsayer, who made the noise? I cannot say for the past few months because of the noise. So we see the devil. The devil is making the noise. Mm. So this would say uh, he chanted with a wooden sword. Mm. So we told the king, this is not devil. The sound is made by human being. Mm. So there was an argument. The king accused that you are wrong. Well, <coughs> if you want me to silence them, I can silence it for you. You don't have to worry. You take the responsibility. The king said yes. So he chanted with the wooden sword, and within five minutes, the sound disappeared. Then the king says, You are right. You are very good to say yes. So after that, he went back. The king asked his men to see why this nine musician stopped playing. The man went up and saw all of them hitless. <laughs> but then, after that, they took the body. What you say, they took the body in the sea. Good. They took the body inside the box in the sea. So one day, a fisherman came and said, Oh, this man, they are trying to walk. He opened it up. And the soul went up. <laughs> and when the soul went to the palace, they asked for life. You know? They asked. So they saw a lot of small dragons asking for life until the, what they call, the emperor got sick. So the emperor asked the soothsayer, how is it going to cure? So the soothsayer said, the only way to the cure is to pound them, you know, knife them as king. Okay. So that's what we do. So, that version of the so story is nine of them, right? In that version of the story, there's nine. Yeah. So, okay, let's, uh, will you write that version down and say where you heard it? <laughs> no, I read it in the book. Oh, okay. Very old book. In my, my, I think it was in 18, uh, 
15 something, 17 something, like that. very old, very old now. Then folks, you can have a that they have got cheap, 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 the story of the 360 is the one that they're telling in 1933. And another one, we saw, they always refer to 360 as the popular story around here. But, you know, somewhere else, nine is a good number. You notice it's not an even number, it's always an odd, oh, 360 is an even number. Oh, would anyone else like to share, comment, ask questions? No. All right, and so with that, we conclude our talk for this time. Uh, please join me again in giving uh, Mary another round of applause.